This is the Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come into the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Friends, grace and peace to you from God the Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A couple things first. Um, Let me explain the mask. Um, Those of you who haven't heard, we've had a stomach bug running through our house this week. Both of the little ones, yikes. Uh, So if I've got bags under my eyes, that's probably why, and that's why they're not here as well. But um, I wanted to make sure that I'm not passing that on to you in case it's somewhere living inside of me. And right now I feel fine, but um, I've asked Pastor Marsha to preside over communion today so that I'm not getting all touchy-feely with things that are gonna be going in your mouth. So there's that to begin with. Secondly, Daylight savings, how about that? (laughs) Woof. My alarm clock went off this morning and I was just, I said one of those prayers. (laughs) I don't wanna get up, oh, this can't be true. So we'll all make sure to keep our eyes out right about 11 o'clock so that folks who are just coming in, we can laugh and laugh and laugh at them. (laughs) Just kidding. On a more serious tip, I'd like to start with a story today. Perhaps you've heard it or something like it before. It's about an American family that was called to uh, travel to London to live. The father was a businessman, and he was called to advise a large British corporation in the 1930s. He brought with him his wife and three very young daughters, one of whom was only a baby when they went They had been in London several years when the bombing raids from the German Nazi Air Force, the Luftwaffe, began. Over the course of several months, they would hear the air sirens going off, leaving the citizens of London to find shelter in basements and in bomb shelters. This American volunteered in something called the Goodwill Neighborhood Watch Program. So upon hearing the sirens, he would run up and down his street to make sure that his neighbors were finding safe shelter and uh, knew what was going on. However, this left his wife and children alone as the sirens screamed their warning. One particular night, the air sirens began to scream in the middle of the night, and the man hustled to put on his jacket and shoes and ran out the door to ensure the safety of their neighbors. His wife and daughters huddled together in their basement, trying to keep each other calm. The youngest daughter confessed to her mom, Mama, I'm so scared. They could hear the bomb blasts getting louder and louder all around them. Mother had already seen families torn apart in the bombings and many of their friends killed. So she had no words of comfort to her daughter, but simply held her close and stroked her hair. However, the oldest, now six years old, piped up and said, well, when I'm scared, I pray to Jesus. And the mother said, that's a great idea. We should all pray to Jesus for our friends and our family and for protection. The youngest asked, will Jesus take the bombs away? And her older sister looked at her and said, no, but he might take the frayedness away. Jesus takes the frayedness away. And the four of them prayed together loudly enough that the sounds of the bombs faded into the background. Friends, Jesus doesn't take the bombs away. Jesus doesn't always take the pain away, doesn't always take the stomach bug away, I've learned. 
Jesus doesn't always take the cancer away. Jesus doesn't always take the injustice away. Jesus doesn't always take the civil unrest away or the retribu <laughs> retributive violence, which we're seeing so much of on our TV screens these days. He doesn't always take the hurricanes away. He doesn't always take the suffering away, but he promises to be with us, and this helps take the frayedness away. We remember and realize that he would never leave us, that we are not alone, especially in suffering, because he knows suffering, and he is with us. In moments of shock and anxiety, despair, Jesus offers to take the worst of it and replace it with his hope and his peace. This is done powerfully in the gift of prayer as we invite him into the deepest and scariest parts and moments of our lives. The words of Jesus from our gospel lesson today come in the middle of a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. He's a Pharisee. He is a very learned person, high up in the religious hierarchy of the Holy Land. Jesus is speaking with a man who knows a lot about God, especially as God has been revealed through the Hebrew scriptures. And so Jesus uses an image that Nicodemus will know well. It's a story from Exodus, from the Exodus, it's actually from the book of Numbers, that he will recognize to explain just who Jesus is as the Son of God. He references the story that we heard in Numbers today. That's why we read these together about the Israelites complaining. And by this point, they've been in the wilderness for decades and complaining has become kind of their full-time job. They complain so much that God gets frustrated. And the text says that God sent out poisonous snakes. But that always bothers me a little bit because aren't snakes venomous, not poisonous? Anyway, details. But they go out and bite the people and kill them. Sounds like a loving and compassionate God, right? All right, enough with you. Send out the snakes. But when Moses pleads to God on behalf of the people, God provides a solution. Cast a bronze snake, put it up on a pole, and everyone who looks at it will not die from the snake bites. This is a bizarre story. Very strange. It's hard to understand. And so it's fitting to me that Blue Cross Blue Shield uses the serpent on a pole as its logo because to me, health insurance is bizarre and hard to understand. I think that's, I think that's what they were going for. But there's one word that I'd like to take a look at in this story today. It's a word that's translated in both verses 8 and 9 as look at. Anyone who looks at the serpent will not die from their snake bite. Now, in the ancient Hebrew word, uh, in the ancient Hebrew language, this word, which is ubit, is quite a bit deeper than simply glancing or kind of noticing something. It's the most intense version of look at than we can think of. A better translation might be behold, consider, take in, engage, even join together with. There is something about this looking that binds you to whatever it is that you are looking at. So we get the sense that the Israelites must consider deeply the grace of God who sent not only the manna to feed them and the quails and the water from the rock and enough for each and every day, but also now this way that they might be saved. They're to really take it all in and be transformed in their faith in order to find the healing that God has offered here. So yeah, it's bizarre for sure, but it's also a really important step for the Israelites in their wilderness wandering as they transform and grow in their faith in God. They're learning to trust God to provide what they needed. It only took 40 years, but they're making their way. Could God have taken the snakes away? Sure, why not? But God asks the people to join in a trusting relationship and take part in the story of their healing and their transformation. That's part of how God operates. They're learning to keep their eyes open, peeled even, searching for the ways that God is blessing them and helping them to be provided for so that they can come 
any, overcome any obstacle. And that's the image that Jesus uses to talk to Nicodemus in the dark of night in a scene that sometimes I've called Nick at night. which contain very famous verses, probably the most famous verse, at least for Christians in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world, this is my paraphrase, God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world, not to condemn the world, but so that the world will be saved. You see John 3.16 at NASCAR events and professional wrestling events, and it's so strange to me, but if we're going to hold signs up, it ought to be John 3.16 and 17. God did not send the Son into the world in order to condemn the world, but so that the world would be saved by him. And I wonder, it feels like in our Christian narrative, at least in this country, we seem to believe in a God that loses a lot. Because if God sent Jesus into the world so that the world might be saved through him, but we somehow still have this underlying belief that most people are cast off and burn in hell, then we have to just kind of face the fact that we're cheering for a loser God. God is not a loser God. God wins the battle. We know this to be true. And at some point, the new Jerusalem will descend to the earth and the gates will be open wide and an untold multitude will be streaming in from all nations. That sounds like a, a winning God to me. The big and comforting promise that lays at the foundation of our faith and trust in God is that God will never leave us behind and that God will provide just what we need as we make this pilgrim journey through life. It does not mean that it's always easy. Frayedness isn't something that just little ones feel. Fear and sorrow and anxiety don't expire when we grow up. They might get redirected or look a, a little differently. For example, I can re remember being young a boy, and I was really scared of quicksand. And I thought, man, when I grow up, I'm really gonna have to look out for quicksand. It turns out, quicksand isn't that big of a deal at all. Like, you never hear somebody say like, oh, you might wanna take the belt line, you know, 401 is pretty quicksandy today. <laughs> it's just not that big of a deal, at least not for us. But, losing loved ones, financial crises, wondering if your kids are okay, waiting for a diagnosis, receiving a diagnosis, broken relationships, all very real and part of the human experience. But the comfort and the calling of our scriptures this morning is twofold. Number one, ultimately God has got you. You know, Luther called John 3.16 the gospel in min miniature. I would say that the scriptures in miniature maybe could be boiled down to this. Through Christ, in the end, it will be okay. So if it isn't all okay, then it isn't the end. Number two, God gives you what you need step by step through your life. One of my least favorite Christian saying, sayings goes like this. God never gives you more than you can handle. Have we heard that before? God never gives you more than you can handle. And sure, absolutely, God does not overwhelm you on purpose. But am I the only one who feels like sometimes there's more going on than I can handle? This, this past week was that at our house, for sure. But in those moments, in those days, sometimes weeks, months, or years, we need to keep our eyes open. God has provided enough, enough support, enough resources, enough time, enough energy. But if you're feeling like you don't have enough, you might just be right. That's why we have each other. I'd much rather if the saying go, God never gives us more than we can handle together. The theme for our music toward the end of our service today is gonna to be wondrous love. <laughs> The, uh, the adult choir is going to sing about wondrous love. Our closing hymn is, is about the wondrous cross and love. This is how God's wondrous love works. Step by step, day by day, providing enough in community. And so together, we're going to have to keep our eyes peeled. 
We're going to have to remember the promises of Scripture. This is going to be a tough year. How many political ads have we already seen? It's going to be tough. But we're going to be together. And we will wind up celebrating the wondrous love of God with our lives. And rejoicing in God's love in Christ. And it will be enough to take the frayedness away. Thanks be to God. Amen.